If you've ever heard any stories about deciphering the structure of DNA, most probably you've been introduced to these gentlemen, Watson and Crick. Um, they uh, were model builders. One of them was physicist. The other one was a chemist. And they built models and tried to um, basically figure out the structure of DNA. <clears throat> Now, if the stories you've heard only acknowledge these two gentlemen, you really don't know the entire story because this in story should include the contribution of Rosalind Franklin. The image that you see on the right is the X-ray diffraction of DNA, and that's the work uh, that she contributed. It was her work, and um, without her data, really the structure of DNA could not have been deciphered. And that is okay. In uh, science, scientists always come up with ideas, scientific theories, discoveries based on the work that other scientists have done as long as their contribution is acknowledged. But um, Rosalind Franklin was different, in this case was different, in that Watson and Crick um, had access, gained access to her work and the, her images and her results and interpretations without her knowledge. Um, <clears throat> when she went away, they went to her supervisor and the supervisor showed them the results, which he should not have done. So if it wasn't because of her X-ray diff diffraction data, Watson and Crick couldn't really develop um, the structure of DNA and they basically, when they published, gave her very little um, credit. Um, so the structure of DNA, basically she was able to determine that DNA is a double helix and there are, these dots probably don't mean anything to you, it just means that it's a double helix and it has repeating um, what's called uh, turns and it was also known that the DNA um, based on this data, that <clears throat> DNA has a backbone that has uh, sugar and phosphate, and then the bases are pointing inward. So this is Rosalind Franklin, and uh, that's another image of her, of the picture that she developed. That's her work. Uh, now, the Nobel Prize was given to, for this discovery of structure of DNA, to Watson and Crick, and um, her supervisor, Maurice Wilkins, unfortunately, by the time the award was given, she had passed away from ovarian cancer, probably due to all those exposure to all those x-rays. And um, the reason she wasn't given one was because Nobel Prizes are not given to people when they die. So it's important that we acknowledge her contribution. So now, and based on their model building, the Watson and Crick model building, and, and Rosalind Franklin's data and uh, interpretations of her data, it was known that the DNA is has a repeating structure. It's um, pretty uniform in its diameter all the way through, and it was known that the base pairs are pointing inwards. But it wasn't really clear which base is facing which base. So in the beginning, when Watson and Crick developed their models, because adenine and guanine were both purines and thymine and cytosine were both pyrimidines, their model included adenine hydrogen bonding with guanine and cytosine hydrogen bonding with thymine. And it kind of didn't make any sense. It, instead of having a uniform structure, their DNA models, instead of having a uniform diameter, they kind of would be really bulgy and then really narrow and then really bulgy and just didn't jive with the data and they had to make sense of that. Um, so there came the data from Edwin Chargaff, who was a chemist, and what he did was that he isolated DNA from all sorts of different 
sources. This data that you hear is specifically from salmon sperm DNA, but when he did the, his experiments, uh, no matter what the source of the DNA was, he got the same results. So what was that result? <clears throat> what he did, he took the DNA and then he broke it by chemical modifications, all the reactions that he know how to do. Uh, he broke down those DNA pieces into individual nucleotides. And then he asked how much, what is the proportion of adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine in each of these DNA molecules? And no matter where he uh, got the DNA from, the source of the DNA, he always saw that the proportion of adenine was equal to proportion of thymine, and proportion of guanine was always equal to the proportion of cytosine. So there was a balance for A and T and G and C. And when they saw that data, all of a sudden, everything fell into place. Because when they built their models, when Watson and Crick built their models with A and T facing inside and hydrogen bonding with one another, and G and C hydrogen bonding with one another, then their model makes sense that would conform to this uniform diameter of the DNA molecule. So here's a history of determining of the DNA structure. And there it is again. Okay, just a few reminders. We've already heard about this when we talked about nucleic acid. So the, uh, the monomer for a nucleic acid, because nucleic acids are polymers, um, are uh, nucleotides and a nucleotide is made of three parts, ribose or deoxyribose sugar. It's a five carbon sugar phosphate functional group and the nitrogen space. And in DNA, there are four different types of nitrogen bases. They're either pyrimidines, which are cytosine and thymine, or purines, which are guanine and adenine. <clears throat> and as we said, the um, two backbones of DNA molecule are held together by a hydrogen bonding. Let me bring my laser pointer is done by hydrogen bonding between the nitrogenous bases. There are two hydrogen bonds between adenine and thymine and three hydrogen bonds between guanine and cytosine. Uh, now we've also talked about the fact that DNA runs in an anti-parallel manner. That means if you look at the backbone on this side and the backbone on the other side, the backbones run in opposite directions. So what does that mean? That means one backbone, which we call one strand, starts with a five prime carbon that is attached to phosphate. And the other end of it ends with the <clears throat> hydroxyl that is attached to the three prime carbon of the sugar. But the complementary strand starts runs in the opposite direction so if you look at the top it starts with the three prime hydroxyl at the end and the beginning and then ends with a five prime phosphate and this is a very very important characteristic of the dna molecule the fact that the complementary strands run in opposite directions so a reminder about differences between dna and rna the sugar that is used, 5-carbon sugar in RNA is ribose, and the 5-carbon sugar that is used in DNA is deoxyribose. So another difference between RNA and DNA is that DNA is double-stranded, RNA is single-stranded, and another important difference is in terms of the nitrogenous bases, both DNA and RNA have C, G, and A, but then in DNA there's thymine, which is replaced by uracil in RNA. <clears throat> so here's another nice little exercise you can do by yourself. I've covered the, um, the two ends of these DNA molecules that are running anti-parallel and try to see if you can, by memory, remember where goes, what goes underneath each of these boxes. <clears throat>